right, welcome to the latest edition of Mob Talk Sit Down. I'm Dave Schratweiser. And I'm George Anastasia. George, a <clears throat> New York mafia icon passes away. The Philly mob guys are on the move and an interesting arrest in South Philadelphia. Yeah, the suspect is still in custody and it's got a strong Delaware County connection. George John Sonny Franzies passes away at 103 years old, probably the oldest living mobster uh, in a long time. That's quite a ripe age to get to. Yeah, and he was a legend on a lot of different levels. This, this guy goes all the way back, no, literally knows where a lot of the bodies were buried. Yeah. Um, and kind of, you know, he was guys and dolls with an edge. This was a guy who, who did it all and stuck by the code of Omerta right to the very, very end. Yeah, did a, uh, got a 50-year sentence at one point and said, I'll do all 50. Yeah, and he almost did. He, did. he I think he spent in total about 40 years in prison a lot of parole violations and then he was imprisoned at the age of 94 for shaking down strip clubs right. in uh, New York City. Hustler and Penthouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that was his last stint. He came out at age 100 yeah. and he passed away. At uh, the time he was the oldest mobster yeah. in the system. Yeah. Nicky Scarfo Sr. was right behind yeah. him in his late 80s kind of thing. But uh, that's an interesting benchmark to be the oldest yeah, guy. Yeah, I guess. The Not many guys system. like that. He was a Colombo family capo and then underboss. Uh, and one of the things he did was really interesting. I'm, I'm looking up at kind of his background. He financed the filming of Deep Throat, yeah. if you remember back in the 70s. And I think he was involved in Texas Chainsaw Murders. He, he, yeah. And he, and he fin helped finance one of Danny Provenzano's films, this, this thing of ours. So, yeah. I mean, he was entrepreneurial. Uh, apparently, people who knew him really liked him, said he was, you know, uh, a man's man kind of thing. Uh, very, very interesting background. And he had two sons, both of whom... I guess disappointed him in that they cooperated varying degrees. His one son, John Jr., actually testified against him. His other son is Michael Franzese. He was a capo in a Columbo family. Right, Michael Franzese was another interesting guy and has kind of made a career out of walking away from the mob. Yeah, He's but he was a huge guy. money maker when he was in the mob. Yeah. I grew up on Long Island. He was into the gas tax. With the Russians. Yes. Yeah. And uh, big, big money. made big headlines. Yeah. Uh, Newsday on Long Island did a big piece with uh, uh, Franzese Sr about a year and a half yeah. ago he was quite candid in there talked a lot about uh, his life and his sons and all that kind of stuff uh, very very good yeah. piece this whole family is very interesting yeah and 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 it is in many ways the end of an era sonny franzese goes back all those years knew everybody was involved with everybody and uh, his passing i mean i think in the underworld everybody noticed it he was an icon as you said yeah i know a guy who uh, was in otisville with him and uh we'll share a little something yeah from that uh, in this piece, but uh, he said the guy was the king of the campus, yeah. you know? Wherever he moved, everything <clears throat> yeah. moved with him. And whatever he said, that's what yeah. that's what happened. People genuinely, genuinely liked him and, and most of them respected him. I mean, he was what he was. And, he and had I'm, a dark side. Yeah, he, didn't, he yeah. never made any bones about that. He was what he was. And the feds, I think, believe he's re responsible for 40 or 50 murders. Yeah. Never was convicted of a murder. Yeah. And the fact that he stayed quiet all these years, facing all that time, and lived to be 100 yeah. in prison yeah. is remarkable. Yeah, you don't see that very often, guys. I mean, this is a guy who I think really believed in that whole code of Amerta, the code of silence, the old old school, very much old school. Is that don't see that anymore. Now? I think, with him. I think by and large, it was his generation was probably the last of that. They really embraced all of that. Now you get in trouble and you're facing big jail sentence. A lot a of deal. guys walk the other way. Yeah, let's make a deal. That's where it is. All right, George, the Philly Wise guys are on the move. They love clubhouses. Uh, they're back to an old home. Uh, they were down in deep South Philadelphia. Now they're up past the Italian market around 9th and Catherine. Yeah. And, uh, what do you think about moving around in clubhouses here in 2020? Well, I mean, you know, it, it, that's not, not so much a mob thing as it's a South Philly thing. Yeah. Guys that, that yeah. belong to organizations. Social clubs, yeah. Yeah, they hung out together. That's, yeah. that's what it is. It's a social club. Yeah. I think given, given what's going on, and maybe nothing's going on, but to be in a spot where you know you're going to meet, it kind of helps law enforcement in terms of yeah. who's who, who's associating with who, those kind of things. Yeah. And you can be sure that the, the Philadelphia PD and the FBI or aware of that probably have oh, I'm sure they are yeah you know they got <laughs> some cameras they got some pictures taken yeah. that kind of thing but the the flip side of that if you're if, talking to the guys on the streets if we're not doing nothing what's the difference sure. I mean that's their point we're so, friends we like to yeah. get together in the neighborhood that kind of thing we've heard yeah. that from uh, Eddie Jacobs it's yeah. good to have friends yeah. when you're right. in the old neighborhood yeah. that kind of thing but it does 
kind of make it easy for law enforcement to clock those guys, see who's kind of related to who, who's in, who's out kind of thing? Yeah, uh, and that, that invariably, if, if a case comes down the road, those kind of photos are used to show associations. Right. Uh, but again, Do you know this guy? Oh, yeah. you don't know the guy? Well, what about this yeah. picture, right? Yeah. It's, it, their argument would be, we're not doing nothing. Who cares? They are Take doing all the anything. pictures you want. So that's... From what I've seen, they're yeah. eating lunch. They're coming and going and coffee. They go for a little walk around the block, yeah. uh, walk and talks, as they used to call them. Yeah, breaking the wall. But it could that be just a stuff. couple yeah. friends going yeah. for a stroll. Yeah. Yeah. But you can be sure law enforcement's aware of it, and, and they track this. And... Uh, if something comes down the road, then a photo or two from that may be yeah. helpful in terms of making a case. And the Merlino crew has kind of uh, moved around a little bit since they all got out of prison. First, they were over at 11th and Jackson. They had an interesting yeah. corner store that comings and goings. They had a couple yeah. Christmas parties there. Right. A lot of guys, 30, 40 guys one time. That attracted there. a lot of attention. Oh, yeah. Then they moved over to a uh, string band uh, mummers kind of headquarters over uh, near Broad Street and that got a lot of attention and was sat on by all kinds of yeah. law enforcement people and things like that. They were in this location near 9th and Catherine about a year and a half ago. They left, now they're back. Yeah. It used yeah. to be a barber shop yeah. for about a year and now they're back to a clubhouse. I remember Joey had a, a, a clubhouse at 6th and Catherine. There That's when go. he and Mikey got hit. Oh yeah, and so the, the old yeah, Greenpeace the, headquarters, yeah, right? right? Yep. So yeah, it's a familiar neighborhood and I, you know, you can make more out of this than you want to, but I think law enforcement is aware of it and they're keeping tabs on it. Is it smart to do that though? To be together like that? You know what? It's, it's, I don't think it's a question of smart. It's habit. It's 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 yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. It's What's the big deal? That would yeah. be their attitude. We're hanging out. We're friends. And usually when I see them there, they're all smiling. They're having a good time. They're eating lunch. They're bringing lunch in. Yeah. They're going out to lunch and coming back. Uh, they what's seem not, to be enjoying it. Yeah, enjoying what's them. not so the lunch? This is probably a good time to enjoy because they're not under, not under yeah. indictment yeah. anyway. Yeah. Well, because they're not doing anything. Well, That's what they would tell there you. There you go. There you go. There you go. And we keep asking that question <laughs> and nothing comes. Yeah. So I, I'm tending to agree with yeah. them at this point now. There you go. Absolutely. Yeah. George, finally, we're going to talk about an arrest uh, this week by the Pennsylvania State Police, a really uh, interesting investigation, nicely put together by them and uh, put before a grand jury by the State Attorney General's office here in Pennsylvania, the arrest of Frank Scarpato. He's 52 years old. He lives in South Philadelphia. They charged him with allegedly running a corrupt organization, a loan sharking business, where they say he put out dozens and dozens of loan sharking loans on the yeah. street, hundreds of thousands of dollars over the past 10 years, and he got popped this week. He's charged with corrupt organizations. He's charged with making terroristic threats, stalking, conspiracy, some very serious charges. Yeah. And the case is down in Delaware County. Delaware County. Yeah. That's where they took it. Yeah. Right. State police are the ground troops in this. We've been saying that all along. They do a lot of the grunt work. And this, this is an interesting case. The question is, is it a standalone case or does it connect to other things? Yeah. You know, I mean, Nicky Caramada used to tell me there's nothing better than shark money. That's yeah. the money maker, the yeah. economy of the mob. You put that money out on the street at two or three points, you know, you're generating a lot of cash. And, and in order to do that, You've got to have one, you got to have customers, and two, you got to have customers who know they got to pay. Yeah. And so that's the question I, I think that is unanswered here is where does this go? Did this guy have any, anybody behind him backing him up? Anybody's he, blessing? Yeah. yeah. Or was he out there on his own? Was he a lone wolf? Hard to believe he would be making that kind of money for that long and not have some kind of understanding or relationship with the guys. Well, let's get back to that for a second. Uh, the state police say he was charging. 56% interest yeah. on a 26 week loan or 112% interest for a year. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah, 10,000 in cash in the safe downstairs, four guns, and these handwritten notebooks of all the loans over the years. Yeah, it's his ledgers. Keep a record. You got to keep a record of all yeah. that stuff. It's, I mean, it's serious, serious money. You think, I did the math one time on a, a, a loan for three points. $10,000 at three points for 10 weeks, you're paying 3,000 in interest in a, in a 10 week period. Then you renew the loan. If you keep that loan going without paying off the principal, well, at that's the, the end key. of the yeah. yeah, at the end of the year you've paid 15.6 in interest and you stole all the 10, and and the loan shark takes the 15.6 and puts it back out on the street. Yeah. That's the math. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Now, how does a guy like that operate in South Philadelphia? He lived two doors down from one of the clubhouses right. uh, and operated out of his home. Had another guy go around allegedly and uh, threaten people and some serious threats. This is all in the case, yeah. This is all in the case, in the paperwork that's come out. It was a grand jury situation, right. so we're going to hear more about this as it comes up. He's, uh, I believe he's um, going to have a preliminary hearing yeah. in early March sometimes, sometime. But ha how does this happen? It says two things. If he's not involved with the mob and organized right. crime figures, how did he do that? And 
Or also, if he's not, how do they not know about this? And with lean times in South Philadelphia, how does that or happen? Why don't you ask him for a piece of his action? Yeah. yeah, that's the question. I mean, that's the unanswered question in all of this is, is this guy connected to somebody? Did he have somebody's approval to do this? Or was he kicking up to somebody? We don't know the answers to any of those questions. Mm -hmm. He says no, from what I've been told. Well, they're, they're the questions that are that law enforcement's going to ask, certainly. And that's something, as, as this case plays out, we may see more of it. Um, it's just fascinating that there are guys out there making money at a time when a lot of guys are scrambling. Yeah, so they're scratching nickels and dimes together to keep things moving. This guy's making putting out on the street hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans and obviously making money if he has 10 grand in a safe kind of deal. Allegedly. All this yeah. is allegedly. But yeah, uh, yes. serious yeah, money. Charges, charges. It's, it's serious money. And, and as I said, the economy of organized crime, the underworld, has always revolved around gambling and loan sharking. And, and this is an example of that. It's big, big money can be made. Because you can bet on credit, and you can't do that really at the casinos yeah. in, in the, right. the new sports bookmaking things. You can't get that kind of credit right. if you don't have credit worthy credit. Yeah, so you, you want to borrow money to bet. You want to borrow money because you're a risk and a bank won't loan you money. You borrow money from a guy like this. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of different reasons why people need to borrow money on the street, but the interest rate is phenomenal. And a lot of people do it. Yeah, oh yeah, sure. You know, because there's no record of it either. If you don't want people to know your business, you want to go borrow money, that's the way to go. But you're going to pay serious interest. And that's where the money is in all of this. Yeah. And you know, it's a fascinating case. Just the beginnings of it, we got to watch it and see how it plays out. $750,000 bail, they got that in Delaware County. Yeah. I, for I, I believe that's why they went to Delaware County, because this gets taken a lot more seriously in Delaware County than it does in Philadelphia County. And some of his alleged victims are Delaware yes, County as were. well, so that's yeah. there's a legitimate reason for it to be down there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a case worth watching, absolutely. Tight case by the state police. Yeah, yeah you know, I, as I said before, they're the ground you're, troops. You're a big advocate of theirs, they, so am I. Yeah, they've done a lot of hard work. Yeah. They oftentimes don't get credit for it, but they're the guys out there, they, they're on the streets, they know what's going they on. They deserve the praise they get. Yeah. All right, George, let's close this out. Uh, Philip Narducci is out of prison. He was at the Brooklyn Federal Detention yes. Center, a nasty place to be. But he's home. I believe he's on house arrest, back working, uh, finished his sentence, and kept his mouth shut, and looks good. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly that case has come and gone. And a lot of brouhaha ended up being a lot of noise about not very much. Okay, we'll see you guys next time.